Were you in the army? I was in the army, yes. What year did you go into the army? I joined the army October 12, 1973. What was your MOS, your job in the army? Um, I was the 67 Gulf, which was a U-21 airplane repairman and crew chief. Okay, so airplane repair and, and crew chief. And yes. so, and so, when we get to uh, November 1978, um, where were you? Where were you based? Uh, I was stationed uh, at Corozal in the Canal Zone, Albrook Air Force Base. Okay, so you were down there in Panama. Yes. How long had you been in Panama by November 78? Uh, a little more than a year, because I rotated out to come back stateside uh, April 1979. Did you have any idea before November 18th, 1978, that there were more than 900 Americans living down in Guyana? Never heard of Guyana before that. Never even heard of Guyana? Never heard um, of it, no. Had you ever heard of Jim Jones or People's Temple or any of that? No. 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 So the tragedy, of course, unfolds on November 18th, 1978. What is your very first memory of word getting to you that something had happened that you needed to be part of the response to? Um, I want to say it's been a while since I've talked, even talked about this. Wow. Um, there was probably a Sunday after after it happened um and the initial uh, uh notification was about a congressman and his uh, uh i guess his entourage being killed in Guyana. and um and what i remember of it initially was that there was an urgency to get there mm -hmm. it is uh my, my uh what i remember of it initially and uh so yeah that, that was the first notification that i heard so a congressman had been killed. Some of the people with him had been killed. That, at the beginning, that's all you knew. That's what we were told, yes. Yeah. So what was the first thing you, you did? I mean, did you have to scramble to, to go or did you have some time or what was the word to you? Uh, we, was, we were preparing to deploy. I, as I said earlier, I crewed a U-21, which is a uh, small fixed wing aircraft. Uh, so my initial job at that point was to prepare the airplane to uh, proceed to Panama, uh, excuse me, to Guyana, uh, because I was the crew chief. So I was responsible for, uh, you know, making sure everything was prepared to go. It was fueled up, uh, inspected and, and that kind of thing. And, uh, and being prepared to fly when, when we were told to uh, leave Panama. So, you said uh, so, excuse me. No, no, no. So you said it's a U-21? Fixed wing aircraft? Yeah. So right. what, what role would that plane play in the situation down in Guyana? Uh, we were part of the search and rescue mission initially. Uh, we, if I'm remembering this correctly, we departed Sunday. Um, and a U-21 is, like I said, it's a small fixed wing airplane, uh, twin engine plane. So we had pretty good legs on us meaning we could fly a long ways. Uh, so our initial, we left Panama, we flew into Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, we remained overnight there and then we arrived into Guyana the following Monday. Did you know everyone on the plane? And let, let me tell you the reason I asked because I've talked to other veterans who they're on planes uh, heading down to Guyana and, and there are people on the plane they don't know who are in civilian clothing and they, you know, later assumed that they were CIA or FBI or something like that. Was, did you see any of that yourself? I did. And, and I can, my response to you would be when we left Panama, since we were going to stay overnight in uh, Caracas, Venezuela, we wore civilian clothing because we were utilizing a civilian airfield. And we stored the plane at the airfield, went to a, a civilian uh, a motel, hotel, spent the night, and the next morning we flew into uh, um, Guyana, Georgetown. Did you pick any 
anybody up in in Caracas? We did not. We did oh. not. Um, we did not. So let's. So when you leave Panama, if I have it correctly, all you know at that point is we've got a congressman and an entourage and members of his entourage who've been killed. There's some kind of emergency in Guyana. So here we go. By the time you leave Caracas, do you have more information? Um, everything we were getting at that point was pretty much was just a lot of chaos. It was very chaotic, um, very little information, um, and much of it was, you know, um, um, I didn't get it from briefing, it was word of mouth kind of stuff that I was getting in Panama. Um, so there was no CNN, no internet, that kind of thing going on. So information was hard to come by. Did you feel that you were, I mean, I'm sure you're curious and wondering what, what this is all about. Um, Absolutely. Did, did you feel that you might be heading into some kind of combat situation? Absolutely. Uh, because we drew our, our weapons, we had ammunition and weapons on board with us. Um, and I assumed it was a combat operation. Wow. So you fly from Caracas into um, Georgetown, is that right? Correct. Correct. And so let's let's have the plane touch the ground in Georgetown. What happens next? Uh, in, almost immediately, I'm not sure how or what uh, um, networks these folks represent. Uh, news people began to approach the airplane, wow. um, asking us various questions: who we were, where we came from, and our airplane was kind of. It stood out because it's red and white. It's a U-21, so it's a, it's a search and rescue bird. Uh, so we stood out like a sore thumb. And uh, so we, these news people were coming from wherever. And um, I'm assuming they thought we'd already been to Jonestown at that point, we had not. And by that point, had you even heard of Jonestown? Had you, had you heard that word? I had not. So you're so not. you're in you're in Georgetown. You've arrived in Georgetown. You've got these journalists. Was it from the journalists? Was it the journalists who first used that word? That was my. That was the first time I heard the word George. Uh, excuse me, Jonestown. Okay. Yes. Wow. How long were you in Georgetown? Um, I want to say we we stayed. Uh, we refueled in, in Georgetown. And the following morning, we inserted a special forces uh, team into uh, Jonestown. Did you do that by helo? Negative. Uh, we did that in the U-21. We landed on the airfield that was adjacent to uh, 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 Jonestown. OK. Uh, um, yeah, it the same airfield where the congressman was shot? Yes, I think so. To my knowledge, there were only two uh, Matthews Ridge and the airfield was adjacent to uh, um, to where the uh, congressman was shot at and shot and killed, and uh, we used both of those at one point or another. Of course, when you see photographs of that airstrip where the congressman and the others are killed, you've got those those planes there. Uh, there was a plane some people were sitting on when they were when they were killed. Did do you remember yes. seeing those planes sitting there on the airstrip? I think I remember the Cessna more so than the uh, Guyanese airliner. Yeah. Um, for whatever reason, that stands out to me. Um, but I do remember the Cessna. It was a smaller airplane. You got these special ops guys on this plane. Are these are Air Force special ops guys? Negative. These were uh, Green Berets, Army Special Forces. Army, Army Special Ops. What do you remember about the special ops guys on the plane? I mean, what did it, what did it feel like on the plane? I, Cause I, I'm assuming, you know, I've talked with special ops guys and I've asked them the same question I asked you, you know, did you assume you were going into a, a firefight kind of situation? I'm assuming that's what these guys are thinking that they might be heading into a fight. I don't know that. Yeah. But, what, what, what was, and they were equipped for, they were equipped for a firefight. They they had their uh, basic load, their, their um, uh, M4s and M16s, and, and uh, yes, they were prepared for a firefight. What do you remember about that flight? 
Um, just do you have any memories? Are they is there are they talking? Are they not talking? Silent? Is it tense? Is it? It's, I think it's more. I'd say anxious and tense. Uh, since we don't know a lot, you know, there's not a lot of information to go on. Um, and uh, I remember, um, I think the final approach into uh, Jonestown stands out to me more than anything else because then we were able to, we began to see the bodies. And um, there were just um, a lot of people uh, on the ground uh, wearing different colored clothing. Um, and I kind of related to even now when I fly and I'm flying to an airport and I'm flying over a large parking lot, those different colors just kind of jump out at me now. And that's what uh, uh, my initial impression of it was like, damn, what happened? You know, um, lots of people. And they were all dead. So you're on the airstrip and this is where the special ops guys get out. This is where the Green Berets get out of the airstrip. Correct. And then, and then they're going to make their way into Jonestown. And then the plane takes off again? Uh, we talked to the ALO. Um, There's the Air Force guys were on the ground. And I'll call them ALO because this is what I know. Uh, Air Force liaison, these guys, are, you know, they got prick 77s and things. And, and I'm, you know, uh, talking to these guys about what went on. Of course, everybody, we're trying to figure out what the hell happened. And so those kinds, those are the conversations we we're having at that point. And, and we departed not long after that because the uh, special forces guys didn't go back with us at that point. What did the what did the uh, Air Force guys tell you? <sighs> Don't recall uh, exactly what was said. Um, uh, we talked about um, what happened as a, in in terms of what exactly was said. Um, my guess is we were saying what I'm saying to you right now. What happened? What, what do you know? And uh, I don't know that they had a lot of information at that point. Your U-21 then takes off and from that point then heads over Jonestown? We, we head out over George, uh, Jonestown again. Um, our, in route to Joan, uh, excuse me, in route to Georgetown. Because at that point, there was no fuel or anything at Jonestown. Uh, we use JP4 jet fuel, so any fueling or anything like that would have to be done uh, at a place called a jet ramp uh, back in uh, Georgetown. Georgetown. Jet ramp over by where it was an old fire station, and that's where we parked and did our maintenance and got took on fuel and that kind of thing and secured our aircraft. So you did you did get a glimpse of Jonestown uh, as you're heading back to Georgetown. I had a glimpse going in and going out. Uh, there's no way you could not see it. At first, well, first of all, how 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 big would you say Jonestown was? Now I know you're in the air, so it's hard to judge. But like maybe using football fields as a comparison, you know, because I think some people think of a sort of a tiny kind of camp, but it was a pretty big, pretty big place, wasn't it? It was. It was, um, I think football fields would be too small uh, in terms of scale. Yeah. Um, I, my best guess, uh, maybe seven, 10 acres. Yeah. Uh, it was a good size camp. Uh, there was like an inner ring uh, of a large, uh, uh, very large buildings that were like made up the center part of the camp. And then around the fringe of it were, I guess, living quarters. Um, Similar to what would a small military camp would look like. Yeah. Am uh, I thinking, yes. Just right in the middle of the jungle, huh? Yeah, just out in the middle of nowhere. There's, there's nothing close to it. There's, um, what I remember the flight over there is just a lot of jungle. Uh, uh, very much like Panama in that regard, just a lot of jungle. You described seeing the bodies and the colors of the clothing. And that's often what you hear. You know, people say, I saw a lot of colors and I thought maybe they had hung out their laundry or something like that. And then I realized what it was. Did, did you know immediately what all those colors were? I didn't think it was laundry. Uh, certainly it wasn't laundry. And I, I recognized right away that, was, that there were people. Um, 
that I knew right away. At that first moment, did you assume that they were all dead, or were you did were you was was, it like what are the what are they doing? Or um, I my my initial impression maybe not dead. At the very least, a lot of people are hurt. A lot of people were dead. There was something. There was no movement. You know what I mean? There was no movement. And, and uh, as I said earlier, here's this uh, red and white airplane with U.S. Army stamped on it. And if these folks were looking for help or or anybody had been alive, I think somebody would have tried to signal to us that, that they were alive. Uh, there was no movement at all. Um, and when we landed, um, the other odd thing about it was I've been in the jungle uh, before. I've never heard the jungle that quiet. There was absolutely no sound, which was, struck me super, uh, just super odd. You know what I mean? There was no sound. Um, jungle's always noisy. Um, but this particular day, uh, and every time that I went there, I never saw or heard any noise or saw any movement or anything like that. Um, but my initial impression was um, these people were dead or they were hurt very bad because uh, we had no idea they had poisoned themselves at that point. I had never heard that until we, we were um, maybe a day or two into it. Uh, and we start to hear those stories coming out. Now, you said you heard the jungle. That's when you're on the airstrip? Yes, yes. And it was just, I mean, would the right word be like an eerie quiet or just, I mean, it's, it's almost like that thing, the quiet's so loud, right? Is that is it almost like that? No. It's that, that kind of quiet, that kind of eerie. Um, and... The only noise that, that I hear at that point is the volume of my, of us talking to each other, uh, the air crew talking to the ALOs, the Air Force guys that are on the ground. Uh, that's what I, that's the only sounds we heard. So, you know, I mean, at this point you're a young adult and, um, you know, when things happen to us, new things, usually what we do is we try to link it to something else we know, some other experience, you know. You go to a new place and say, oh, this reminds me a little bit of something else I saw. Um, what were you doing with these first impressions? You're, you're seeing all these bodies at the very, at the very least, they're hurt. I mean, what, what is the initial impact on you of, of all this? Um, I, I'm going to say it's hard to describe, you know, my, um, I'm confused, you know what I mean? The confusion is running through my mind that what, what happened is running through my mind. Um, uh, who did it? It's running through my mind. Uh, because now, you know, as I said earlier, up to that point, we considered that, that there were still hostile people running around with weapons down there. We, I didn't, I had no idea how these folks were injured or killed uh, uh, up until that point. So that fear factor comes into it as well. You know, are these folks actively moving in and around this airfield that we, we were starting to land uh, and fly in and out of? Uh, so um, uh, my famous word is, oh shit, you know what I mean? It's like, what's, what's going on here? Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. How many times did you fly in and out? You, you A minute ago, you used the phrase, e every time, Every time we went in there, how, how, about how many times did you did you go back, back and forth? Um, several, multiple times. Uh, if not directly into the airfield, it was adjacent. Uh, went in and out of Matthews Ridge. We we were doing uh, log work. You know, stuff needed to go out. People needed to go out. Uh, that kind of thing. So multiple times. In. Any of these times back and forth mentioned Matthews Ridge, and then we've got the, the airstrip there. Um, did you have any interactions at all with, of course, there aren't very many Jonestown people left, but there are some in Georgetown. Did you have any interaction at all with any of the People's Temple people? No. No, I no, never saw any. We, uh, the only folk I saw um, at either site uh, were American military guys. Yeah. Did you ever get into Jonestown itself? I did not. 
Okay, so you're, there, you're there in the airstrip. So how long are you in Guyana altogether? Uh, we arrived at Monday and I think we left either the day after Thanksgiving or which would have been a Friday or Saturday, so in that timeline. So like right seven days. Roughly a week. Um, yeah. So just describe that week in general, you know, sort of the beginning, you know, the beginning of the story we've described, um, then you got the middle, and then I'm interested in talking about now we're flying out of Guyana, but so take us to, you know, now we're in day two, now, presumably you're hearing, okay, we got a lot of people who are dead. And of course, here in the States, we're getting news reports, 200, 300, 500. Turns out you got bodies on bodies. Now we're up over 900. Um, right. What, what is that week like? How do you, how would you describe sort of that, that whole week from, you know, day two through the end of it? It, it was uh, real hectic. We, we, we were constantly working, we were constantly flying. Uh, we didn't have to, uh, um, we lived in a, um, and again, I keep referring to it as the old fire station uh, or, or uh, it was another name and it may have been jet ramp comes to mind for whatever reason, mm. uh, but we stayed there. So when we weren't physically flying and going in and out, we were pretty beat. Uh, and then at the same time, we're doing maintenance on the aircraft to keep it up. Um, they began to bring bodies back. And as you said a moment ago, the numbers kept increasing. Um, I want to say initially the first numbers I started to hear were maybe a few hundred, a couple hundred people. Or, and then that became 400 and, and, and so forth and so on. And then they found the children. And I think that was... Uh, um, uh, the Air Force is flying them back in on, on their uh, CH-53s, I think they were. Mm -hmm. And the jet ramp or whatever, the firehouse wasn't far from where they were staging these coffins and body bags. So the stench was just horrible. Uh, um, even, even though they were in body bags and they, and I'm told the body bags leaked. So they brought in these metal containers, shipping containers. Uh, for the lack of better terms. And, and even with that, the stench was there. Um, um, and, and I recall that as much as anything else, uh, that, that smell. And um, the day that they found the children may have been three, maybe four days. In, and that seemed to take a big toll on, on, on everybody. Because um, I'm on the flight line and I'm talking to the air crews that are coming back and forth. Because you know, we're just, you know, sharing information at that point. And that particular day they found the uh, um, children. That just seemed to really um, take the steam out of everybody. Because uh, apparently, you know, as you said earlier today, the, the parents, the mother, whoever had followed the children, so therefore we didn't know they were even there. Uh, so that, that, that really took a toll on all of us. And so you're, you're smelling, you know, the, you know, the corpses, um, and it's very hot and humid, right? Very hot, very humid, yes. Yeah. And did did you also see the body bags and the... Yes, the, yeah. Yeah, the other... Yeah. Um, they, they had a huge a staging area, and the 141s that were flying in from the States would fly in, and they would they had these uh, uh, 141s, C-141s. Uh, they would load these containers up on the 141s and they would take them back to um, um, Dover, Delaware at that point. So they staged them right there at, the, uh, at, the, at that part of the airfield. Wow. Um, so, you know, I, I've asked you about kind of the initial impacts and, you know, you mentioned um, confusion and what's, you know, what's going on. And so now let's say we're in day four day five, and we have a pretty good idea of, of what happened. Um, how are you processing stuff at that point? And then the news is coming in. Not only are the numbers growing, but now we've got children. And I don't know if you know this at the time, but maybe we've got three children in the same body bag, that, that sort of thing. Um, what, 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 how is this all affecting you day four, day five? 
Uh, no, I don't remember. Um, um, it was just getting the job done at that point, getting the mission done. And, uh, and so that was my mission focus. Uh, let's get this done. Um, never heard the story about um, 24 children in body bags. Never heard that story until now. Um, um, yeah, so that's, that's breaking news for me. Uh, but at that point, it's, um, uh, let's drive on. Let's get the mission done. And uh, that's, that was the focus. And um, that, I think that was pretty much what everybody was doing. Um, so kind of, you almost kind of, what, in a way, you almost kind of become a robot kind of kind of thing? You just, uh, in a way, kind of shut down and just, just work and don't think about the, don't think about really what's going on? Pretty much, yeah. Because I think at, at, certain, at, certain, at a certain point, would it probably would have become overwhelming at some point because that amount of death, and I talked to guys who had, um, that were with us that had been to a few tours in Nam and that kind of thing. And, and uh, so those conversations came up. I had one guy, um, one guy in particular, I remember he was another crew chief that I'd met and we were talking. He said, you know, in all his years and his time in Nam, he'd seen a lot of death. He'd never seen anything like that before. And uh, so, um, no, uh, so you you know stay focused on the job, do the job, um, yeah. get the job done, and uh, and uh, get out of there. What do you remember about um, you know? So about a week, about a week after you take off. So now your plane is wheels up, and you're heading out of Georgetown. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about that? Um, well, I remember um, Thanksgiving, we were there during that, that period. They flew in meals for us, uh, Thanksgiving dinners. And I want to say, and I'm just, again, it's a long time ago. Uh, I remember the guys coming back because a lot of those guys were from Fort Clayton. Uh, grave registration showed up maybe day three, day four into the mission. So the infantry guys out of Clayton, which was not far from Corzell, not far from uh, uh, the air base, uh, Albrook, um, I knew some of them. Uh, they came back and they, and, um, they began to burn their uniforms. Uh, that's how bad the stench was in their uniform. And it was this huge pit and they put all their clothing in there, they burned them and issued them uh, uh, brand new clothing, uh, brand new jungle fatigues and boots, the whole works, the whole nine. And so then I, I knew that it's when it kind of settled into my mind that the mission was done for us. And this and that we will be headed. And, and and this happened in Guyana. It did, yes. Burning the uniforms yes. in Guyana, right? Uh, because of the stench. Yeah. And, uh, so, um, so in my mind, then I said, okay, that we're Mike Charlie at this time. We're mission completed at this time. And uh, so I, then I'm preparing myself because now we're getting ready to uh, go back in a few days. Uh, and. Not sure the exact date that we departed, uh, thinking maybe the Friday or that Saturday uh, is what comes to mind, but not sure the exact date. So, you know, at what point does this kind of settle in? So I'm, I'm imagining you now, you're back in base in Panama. Um, I'm assuming you're living in barracks, you head back to the barracks. Yeah. You know, you're by yourself or maybe talking with other people. I mean, at what point does it settle in? Like, what 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 the heck was I just involved in? I mean, did that happen? Like, what what was that, you know, that week I just spent? It, it did. Um, and um, um, I can't give you a timeline of when it happened or or anything like that, but there's that moment where you kind of realize, I, I, maybe when we're landing back in Panama or whatever, I don't know, uh, but you know, you don't walk away from that kind of thing unscathed. Um, you just don't, and uh, that that's a long shadow. It, it sticks with you for a while. Uh, it sticks with you forever. I don't think I ever forget that. Well, you just said, you know, this event cast a long shadow. And then you said you won't forget it, but is it only a memory or is it 
a shadow in some other way. You, you said you don't get out of this kind of thing unscathed. Yeah, I'm, after seeing that and learning the story behind it, because uh, initially we didn't know the story, uh, I don't practice any kind of religion. Um, in fact, um, after learning this story, uh, it's like, you know, I'm very uh, skeptical of, of, of isolating folk or isolating myself or just blindly believing anything because I've seen the uh, evil that, that people have done in the name of religion, um, politics, religion, and God knows what else. Um, that was my, my largest takeaway psychologically. Um, uh, every year in the fall, I get this feeling about myself. I, you know, hard to describe it, but, and um, just really, it's hard to describe really weird. I, and I rarely talk about it. Um, um, probably less than my immediate family, very few people in life or ever went there. My family knows because they saw the plaque on the wall from Guyana uh, uh, for the awards I received uh, while I was there. Uh, so what, very rarely do I speak of it. What awards did you receive? Uh, the Humanitarian Service Medal and uh, the Joint Commendation Service Medal. Mm. So these days, let's say you're somewhere, you're at a restaurant, you know, you're at a store and you overhear somebody use that phrase, you know, don't drink the Kool-Aid or, you know, so-and-so drank the Kool-Aid. Does that, does that always kind of make you pause a little bit when you hear that? It actually pisses me off because um, I, you know, people don't realize um, what that, you know, what that symbolizes to me. What does, experience. What, what does yeah. it symbolize to you? Death. You know what I mean? These, these people blindly followed this man. They trusted him. And uh, as a result of that trust, he killed 900 and so odd uh, Americans. Um, that, that's a lot. That's a lot. And so to joke about something like that, no, that's not cool. Cool Have you ever world. has that ever happened to you where you've heard somebody use that phrase and you just and you just kind of said yeah. something? Yes. Like what happened? They just kind of looked at me kind of, you know, crazy or whatever, but I said, you know, that's that's not cool. That's not cool. A lot of people died uh drinking the Kool-Aid that you making fun of right now. That's not cool. And, did you um, tell them that you you had actually seen it? I did not. No. I did not. Yeah. If I could give you a pill that would take away the memories you have from what you saw in Guyana, would you take that pill? No. Why not? Um, I think those kind of experiences are, are shake people and they shape your thinking. Um, uh, as I said earlier, it's a long shadow. Um, and I, I learned from it, I, and um, no, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give that back. You know, I want that experience in, in my life, you know what I mean? Um, I just would. Let's pretend we're on one of those news channels where you're supposed to, you know, fix the world in two minutes, you know, one of those kind of situations. Mm -hmm. And I just ask you, you know, what is the, what's the thing that most stands out in your mind when you remember that week in a country you had never even heard of before, and I had never heard of it either, you know, until the news reports. Now all of a sudden you're in a country you'd never heard of before. You're there for a week. What what most stands out in your mind from that time? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, Cause there's a lot of emotions in there. Um, um, and I don't know that I can answer that question. Um, um, again, I go back to the whole thing about blindly following someone, um, being afraid to question the uh, authority. Um, there's any number of questions that would come to my mind. Uh, um, an old Colin Powell book that I've read years ago, I'm, I'm a big fan of his, is uh, never be afraid to question the experts. 
and, and never be afraid to in that in that same vein to uh, um, challenge people uh, on, on what they're telling you, um, and don't blindly follow anything. I, I don't care who it is. Um, that would be my takeaway. I, I don't know that that could have ever been prevented because of how isolated they were, and um, isolation is a uh, um, you know. I think it was the biggest factor in that. These folks weren't allowed to hear news outside of what um, he decided to allow them to know. And uh, that, that's, uh, so freedom of the press, I think, would be my, my thing. I don't care where you're at, if you're in a foxhole in the middle of Timbuktu or whatever, um, take in information and, and evaluate it and, 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 and make sure it's factual. And don't be afraid to challenge people, you know, or information for that matter. Um, this dangerous when, when you get to a place where if it is if it's above uh, um, questioning and I can't question it, I don't want a damn thing to do it. I don't care who it is. Uh, I don't want anything to do it. Uh, so that would be my take from it. Um, challenge it and challenge you know whoever's giving it to you. And you know this better than I mean almost anyone else because you've you've seen the consequences of what happens when people get into a situation where they're not able to challenge and they're not able to question absolutely is there anything else that comes to mind that um that we haven't touched on here that you'd like to share i would it's not related well i guess it is related um i've spoken to i don't know uh, a few people in the last few years and uh, about this incident here. Very few of them understand the military's role in this, in this entire uh, uh, thing. And, uh, and I think it's a story that um, is overlooked uh, and, and maybe not talked about enough, or either whether it be military or civilians for that matter, because uh, I don't know that they teach this kind of thing. And uh, no, uh, I'd I like to see those guys, excuse me? No, I was just saying I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. And my hope is that, is that other veterans will, will hear what you're saying and then will be willing to share their own stories because it's really important to, to get these stories recorded. There's a lot of good soldiers there, a lot of good airmen there that, uh, during my time frame that um, um, we did a tremendous job, did a hell of a job, and um, uh, deserve the recognition that comes with that. And uh, that's, that's what I'd like to say. I'd like to say thank you to all those guys.